Hi, first graders. Today we're going to listen to the folk tale called Thumbelina. Remember that the characters in a story are the people or animals. The setting is where and when the story takes place. The plot of a story is what happens from the beginning to the end. Also remember that the conflict of a story is the problem that the characters face. While you're listening to the story today, be thinking about all of those parts of the story. Also be thinking about how Thumbelina is similar and different from yesterday's story, Tom Thumb. Once there was a woman who wanted a child more than anything in the world. At last, in loneliness and sorrow, she went to a wise old woman and spoke of her desire. That's as easy as winking, said the wise old woman. Take this seed and plant it in a flower pot filled with good, rich earth. Water it carefully and guard it very well. The woman did as the wise old woman had said. The first time she watered the seed, a large and brilliant flower sprang up. It was still a bud, its petals tightly closed. The woman bent to kiss the flower, but the moment her lips touched the silky petals, they began to open. The woman could not believe her eyes. There, inside, sat a tiny little girl. She was perfectly formed, as graceful as the flower from which she came. When the woman held her, she discovered that the tiny girl was scarcely the size of her thumb. Though she was a wonderful child in every way, she never grew at all. She was called Thumbelina and was treated with great extravagance and care. In her cradle was a polished her cradle was a polished walnut shell. Each night she slept between two fresh flower petals. In the daytime, she liked to sit on a table and sing in the sunlight. Her voice was very beautiful, high and haunting and silvery. One night, as she lay sleeping, a toad hopped in at the window. What a lovely wife for my son, she said. Without even looking around her, she took the walnut shell and hopped off with it to the garden. Here, look what I brought you, said the toad proudly to her son. But the only sound he could utter was croak, croak, croak. Don't talk so loud or you will wake her, complained the mother toad. She might still run away from us. So the mother toad and her sons went back to their home near the stream's edge. They placed Thumbelina on a lily pad in the middle of the water so that she could not escape. In the morning, Thumbelina woke up and looked all around her at the great arch arcing sky. She felt her lily pad rock with the motion of the stream and cried out in terror. The mother toad and her son heard Thumbelina crying and went to see what was the matter. Thinking that Thumbelina was just crying out in loneliness, they ignored her and returned to making their wedding plans. Upon hearing her sobs, a fish swimming in the water below came to the surface and looked curiously at Thumbelina. A butterfly also heard the cries and flew over to see what was wrong. Oh, please help me, she said. I must get away from here. And so the fish began to gnaw at the lily stalk with its sharp teeth. At last, the leaf broke free and floated down the stream. Away went Thumbelina, gently spinning with the current. Gradually, her fear left her and she began to enjoy the journey. Never before had she been outside. Thumbelina floated down the river far, far away from the mother toad and her son. It was summertime, and she spent the next several months drifting peacefully from place to place along the shore. When it rained, she slept under a large spreading leaf to shelter herself from the rain. For food, she sipped nectar from the flowers. She ate wild berries and drank dew that lay on the leaves at dawn. All the while, she listened to the birds chirping in the trees above her, and she made friends with butterflies that floated on the breeze nearby. Before long, though, summer came to an end and autumn quickly passed. The cold chill of winter soon filled the air. There were no more berries for food and all the birds and butterflies had disappeared. Thumbelina was cold and hungry. Now she was truly alone and the place was foreign to her. And then it started to snow. The snow came at her in white swirling clouds and she quickly wrapped herself up in a leaf curled up under a mushroom and tried to keep herself dry. Still, she shivered with cold. 
Not far away, a field mouse was gathering some last bits of kindling to burn in her fireplace during the winter. When she saw Thumbelina, she said, My poor dear, you are nearly frozen with cold. You must come home and spend the winter with me. I have plenty to eat, and my home is warm and dry. Thumbelina gracefully accepted the invitation and followed the mouse to a small hole in the ground. As they descended into the tunnel, Thumbelina realized that she was in a snug, small dwelling of the field mouse. Corn was piled up around her, and, it, and the smell was in the air. Please, said Thumbelina, could I have a bit of corn to eat? Oh, you poor dear, the mouse said. You had better come into my room and have dinner with me. The two got on well together, and after some days, the field mouse invited Thumbelina to work for her and stay the winter. Every day, Thumbelina helped the field mouse with her housework, and they would spend the rest of the day enjoying a cup of tea and chatting before the fire. Thumbelina soon grew very fond of the field mouse. She was happy to have found such a good, kind friend. Late one evening, the field mouse said to dust the floor and polish everything in the room until it shined. An important visitor was coming to call. The visitor was a mole who was very rich and wore a sleek velvet coat, but he had very poor eyesight and even with his glasses, he could barely see. He hated the sun and mocked all of the creatures who lived outside. The field mouse, however, was very impressed by the mole's riches. She told Thumbelina to sing for him and tell stories of her travels. As he listened to Thumbelina's beautiful voice, the mole fell in love with her. The next time he came for vis to visit, he said he would show his rooms underground. By the pale light of a piece of torchwood, he led them through a long, twisting passage. Suddenly, they came upon a swallow laying sprawled in the passageway. Thumbelina felt very sorry for the swallow, but the mole kicked at him with his stumpy legs. What a pitiful life to be a bird, he said. A creature who does nothing all day but fly from branch to branch is not prepared for the winter. Thumbelina said nothing and let the mole and the field mouse walk on ahead. Goodbye, Swallow, she said. It might have been you who sang to me this summer when all the trees were green. She laid her head on the soft feathers for just a moment and then darted back in fear. Something moved inside of him, slow and steady, like the rhythm of a heartbeat. The bird was not dead. He was merely numbed with cold. The warmth of Thumbelina's body had stirred him back to life. Each night after that, Thumbelina crept out of bed to tend to the swallow. As he grew stronger, he told her how he had torn his wing on a thorn bush. The other swallows had flown away to warm, to warm countries, but he had not been able to keep up with them. At last, he could go no further, and he plummeted to the ground. Thumbelina kept the swallow a secret from the field mouse and the mole. When spring warmed the earth once more, Thumbelina knew it was time for the swallow to go. His wing had healed now. Each night he fluttered it over and over again, strengthening it for flying. Won't you come with me? he asked. You could easily sit up on my back and I will carry you away into the leafy woods. But Thumbelina could not bring herself to abandon the field mouse who had kept her from starving. She made a hole in the roof of the passageway and watched longingly as the swallow flew out into the sunshine. She felt that all the pleasure in her life was going away with him. Every evening now, the mole came to call on Thumbelina. He made her sing until her voice grew hoarse. Whenever she stopped, he prodded her to continue. This was the way he loved her. Without ever asking once, the mole and the field mouse agreed that Thumbelina would marry him in autumn. But Thumbelina did not want to marry the mole, and so she wept bitterly whenever she thought of their wedding day. Every morning when the sun rose and every evening when it set, she was allowed to go to the door sill and stand outside. In the heat of August, the corn had grown as high as a forest. When the wind blew the stalks apart, she could see the bright pieces of sky. How beautiful it was. She did not know how she would keep, live deep inside the earth with the mole, whom she now despised more than ever. At the time of her wedding, as the time of her wedding grew closer, she sobbed out in, the, in fears in her 
She sobbed her fears to the field mouse. Oh, nonsense, the field mouse said. Don't be stubborn. His velvet coat is handsome, and the food in his pantry is fit for a queen. Thumbelina understood then that she was trapped as surely as she was in a cage. Summer was ending, and she knew she would never be able to survive outside through the harsh, cold winter months. But now the wedding day had come. For the last time, Thumbelina crept to the door sill to stand in the sunshine. She knew the mole would never allow her to leave his side. She cried as she felt the warmth upon her face and made ready to go back into the earth. But then, suddenly, above her, she heard a shower of notes, a glorious morning song. Thumbelina looked up, and there was the swallow. The cold winter was coming again. The bird looked at her and said, I've looked for you many times, and now I must fly away to warm countries. Won't you come with me? I'll take you to where it is always summer. This time, Thumbelina did not hesitate. She climbed up onto the swallow's back. Then he rose up into the sky. They flew over forests and fields, high above mountains with snow-capped peaks. When Thumbelina felt cold in the bleak air, she crept in under the swallow's feathers. It was so secure and close, a cloverlet of the softest down. At last they arrived in the warm countries. The sun beat down upon the earth, and the light was clear as crystal. Lemons and oranges hung on the trees, and the air was fragrant with the, fragrant with the smell of spices. The swallow flew on until they came to a dazzling white palace. In the pillars there were many nests, and one of those were the swallow's home. I dearly love you, and I yearn to keep you with me, said the swallow sadly. But I do not think you could live up as high as I do, for when the wind comes, you might fall. Why don't you take one of those flo flowers that grow below for your home? At least we should be neighbors. Thumbelina did not remember that she had once lived in a flower but the idea seemed to be good to her. The swallow set her gently on the petals of a brilliantly colored flower. Then she slid inside. But this could not be, she thought. This home was already taken. A young man was standing there, shining as if he had been made of glass. A gold crown was on his head, and gauzy, white, gauzy wings grew from his back. Isn't he wonderful? Thumbelina thought. Never before had she seen a person just her size. This young man explained to Thumbelina that a small person lived in each of the flowers. He was their king. Then he took off his crown and placed it upon her head. You are so lovely, he said. Won't you be my queen? Thumbelina never thought to refuse. She could tell he was kind just by the sound of his voice. She felt that at last she had come home. Then the king declared that there was to be a welcoming party more joyful than any had ever seen in the land. From all the flowers, men and women came, bringing gifts for Thumbelina. But the most wonderful was a pair of tiny wings that she could fasten to her back, so that she too could dart from flower to flower. Everyone danced all night, and above them in his nest was the swallow, singing for them his most heartwarming tune.